I want to say welcome to all of you who are with us today for the last week of this series called Do Something. I want to be real clear, this is not the end of our Do Something initiatives. As you've already seen in this service, I hope, we have a bunch planned for the next several weeks. And if you weren't here to see it in the service, you should have been here. Or if you were in the service but you got here too late to see it, hey, start coming in on time. Uh, we always start the service at the same time, like for the last 150 weeks or so. But we do this Do Something series every year, and for lots of us, it's our favorite time of the year. And even though we're ending the teaching, we aren't ending the initiative, so I hope you'll keep coming for, for that. We do this every year just to let you a little bit on the inside if you're new around here, because uh, we believe that Jesus is God's Son and that he commanded us to do it. And I know you, you may not believe that he's God's son. That's okay. You don't have to believe what we believe. But to understand us, you need to understand we believe it, and that he commanded us to uh, take care of people that are poor, the people that live in the margins of this world, the people that are overlooked and in need. And because of that, uh, every year around here, in fact, we do it all year long, uh, every week of every month of every year, uh, we try to partner with great organizations in our community and around the world to make a difference for the poor and the marginalized in our world. But every year, uh, these last few weeks of the year, we, as I say, like to grab the flywheel of compassion in our church and give it a good spin so that the momentum of that will keep going throughout the year so that we can be the kind of people who don't just feel uh, generous toward people. We actually do something about those in need in our world. Now, the other reason we always do this series is not just so we can do something tangibly about those in need in our world, but so that we can do something about a need that we have because we live in the richest culture the world's ever known. For us, it winds up affecting us, and many times we don't know it, so every year we take this as an opportunity to teach us about what we need to learn about uh, being where we are. So for the last few weeks, we've uh, been learning from this scripture in the Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're going to continue that. It tells us how to be rich, and not how to get rich. Uh, that's not what we're talking about in this series. We're, what we learned in the very first week of this series is that uh, compared to most people in the world, most of the people in our world already see us as being rich. We're trying to learn how to be good at being rich. And so the first thing we learned is that if you're going to be rich, first you just got to admit it. So you have to say, hey, God has blessed me with more than I need. I'm rich. And then the second thing that we do is once we admit that we're rich, we just have to say, you know what? Therefore, I won't trust in my riches. I'll, rich, I'll trust in him who richly provides. And then last week, we, in addition to that, we said, therefore, because of that, we'll take the extra time and money that we have, we'll, our margin in our life, and we will leverage for the use of others. That means that I'll figure out how in my life I can really begin to give uh, so that I can be generous and I can do good works for the sake of others. I won't take my extra time and money and allow uh, the pull of our culture just to assume that because it came to me that it was for me and consume it on me. I will leverage my extra for the sake of other people. So today, to wind up the teaching of this, again, not the Do Something initiatives, but to uh, end uh, the teaching on this, uh, I, I want to teach the last part of these verses we've been looking at, these three verses that are written by a guy named Paul. And Paul's a follower of Jesus, uh, who, like many of you, uh, are followers of Jesus. Paul came to follow Jesus long after he had been resurrected. He didn't walk and talk with Jesus like the other disciples. He became a follower of Jesus after he, uh, Jesus had ascended into heaven. And we believe this book is written near the end of his life to a man that he's mentoring named Timothy. That's why the book's called First Timothy. And in this particular section, he's saying to Timothy, this is what you need to teach people who are rich. Now, before I read you this last piece of advice Paul has for people like us in a rich culture, uh, I just need to say to you, if you're newer to the Bible or you're newer to following Christ or you've followed Christ for a while but you don't really know much about the Bible, uh, there's a part of what I'm going to say today that you might think, what? Because this isn't normally the way we think about uh, wealth and the connection that it has to anything in our world and to us. And because of that, you might think, well, that's just a teaching in a little obscure part of the Bible to this guy named Timothy. I just want to say to you, this teaching that comes out of this part in this verse today is really taught many places in the Bible and is taught in several places by Jesus specifically. In fact, it was taught so much by Jesus and was a part of the teaching of Jesus 
that Paul just alludes to something that would refer Timothy back to the teaching of Jesus. And because he knew Timothy understood the teaching of Jesus so well, he didn't have to spell it all out. He could just allude to it, and Timothy knew so much about the teaching of Jesus that he would get it. Uh, let me read it to you, and uh, we'll get on, and I'll try to explain that to you in just a second. So let me read to you what we've already talked about in this uh, series. Uh, here's where he starts. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now he's just saying, uh, God's a very good father, and he does what good fathers do. He, pr he provides, and God has provided everything for you. Verse 18. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. There's our phrase, be rich in good deeds, and to be generous, willing to share. That's what we learned about last week. Now, here comes the final part. And I just want to put the first phrase up for you in this way. That's how he starts, and I don't want you to miss that that little phrase, in this way, I want to separate it out so that you get those three words actually hang on, on the previous phrase. Because you are going to be rich in good deeds, willing to share, you're going to learn to be generous, be rich in good deeds, and willing to share. In that way, by being rich in good deeds and willing to share, in that way, you're going to cause something to happen. In that way, something's going to happen. It's going to accomplish something in your way. By doing that thing in this way, here's what's going to happen. In this way, by being rich in good deeds and willing to share, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves. Now, let's say in some ways that didn't make sense because he's talking to rich people, so they already have treasure. They don't need to lay anything up. Uh, and in another way, it doesn't make sense because just the pure math of it. If you have something, and he just told me to give it away in this way, by giving it away, I'll lay up. But we know the math is if I have ten of something and I give one away, I didn't store that one up. I gave it away. Now I don't have eleven. I have nine. But Paul says, here's the rest of the phrase, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. By giving it away... By being generous, willing to share, rich in good deeds, I will lay up treasure, but not in this world, but in the age to come. And what Paul is alluding to is a teaching of Jesus in really several places in the Scripture, but specifically Jesus, that there is a relationship between our wealth and eternity. That there is this connection that lots of times we don't think about between our riches and our eternity. That in a sense, there's something about how we spend and invest and give what we have been blessed with that has a connection with what's going to happen with us in the coming age. Paul just ends this teaching with saying, now, Timothy, make sure, don't forget to teach them, to remind them that they've got to view their wealth through the lens of eternity. That they've got to see everything through the lens of eternity, and if they do, and they begin to loosen their grip on all the stuff they have, they're rich in good deeds, they're willing to share, that their stuff will begin to loosen its grip on them, and they'll lay up a firm foundation for the age to come. Now, I'm going to explain that to you in just a second, but I want, to, I want you to know that my experience is, from where I stand as a pastor because of what I get to do, I, I can just say you, to you that the this principle that Paul is teaching that I'm going to talk to you about that Jesus originally taught, it's been the most transformational teaching for people that I have met who are truly generous. It's way more transformational than guilt. And what I mean by that is there's certainly a motivation that people become gener uh, generous, but I have found only short term if you can motivate them through guilt. Like you show a person you've got so much more than other people and therefore... You ought to help them because you have so much. Don't you feel guilty about that? And for a short term, that motivates people to give. But seldom does that turn somebody into a truly generous person. I'll say to you, this principle that he's talking about is also a better motivation than just showing people a need. You know, you can go, like some of you have, to fundraisers where people who do video with the right music and it sounds right and everything, and they move your heart and you see the need. Or I've watched people, you know, will go on trips to Haiti and people will see how much they have and how little people have and how much, if they just gave a little bit, it would make a huge difference there. They see the need and they're motivated to give. But 
It doesn't truly turn them into a generous person. What I'm saying is, for the people that I have met who are truly generous, and you begin to ask them, not the wealthiest people I've met, but the most generous people i met, and you ask them, what was the moment when you truly went from being captured by what our culture is captured by, about getting as much as we can, and you became a person who not only felt compassion and generosity, but you became generous, what did that? I've never heard a person say, hey, I was just noticing how much I had and how little other people had, and I felt guilty, and I began to give, give and that changed my life. I've never met, met anybody that said, I saw the need, and it was so clear to me, and I wanted to meet that need, and that changed my life. But I have heard person after person of the most generous people I know who say, when I began to see the connection between how I managed what had been ble- I had been blessed with in this world and the connection that had for me in the world that was to come, it changed everything. As I began to loosen my grip on the stuff in this world, it began to loosen its grip on me and... Things began to change in my life that I never thought would change. I've heard that so many times. And in the really generous people I know, not the wealthiest people I know, I'll say that again because you can give lots of money, but it not really be a large percentage of what you give. At the end of the day, they became truly generous, the most generous people I know, not because of guilt, not because of need, but because they began to see the stuff that God had given them to have some effect on what would happen in eternity. So Paul just says to Timothy, Timothy, tell the rich people not to be arrogant. Don't put their hope in wealth. It's so uncertain. Trust in God and learn to be, to be good, to be generous, to be rich in good deeds. And in that way, they will set a foundation for themselves in the age that is to come. He's saying, look at your stuff and the way you manage your stuff. It has a bigger impact than you think. Now, all Paul is doing is alluding to a teaching that Jesus taught uh, when he was walking around on the planet. And since I know that many of you don't know the Bible as well as as Timothy did because of the nature of our church and because of the nature of our culture, Timothy knew more about the teaching of Jesus and it was more part of his life than for many of us. I want to actually take a few minutes and I want to teach you what Jesus had to actually say on this in one of the places that he said it. I want to show you a story, a place where Jesus uh, told a story that directly applies to this and where, in fact, that phrase, lay up for yourself treasure, comes from. I want to try to put it in the context for you of why he said it and where he said it so you can get how it applies. Um, And then I want to show you how it connects this whole thing together back with 1 Timothy. So Jesus is teaching one day, and he gets interrupted by a guy who wants to talk to him about an inheritance. He says, Teacher, my brother and I have an inheritance, and I, he's not giving my, me my fair share. Tell him to share with me. Now, that sounds immediately relevant to many of you because you've known people, or you yourself have been in a position where you've received an inheritance and you think somebody's been unfair with you. And so this guy's just saying, well, you've known people to be going through. Someone has received an inheritance, and they think someone's trying to cheat them. And he come to Jesus and say, Jesus, tell my brother to do what's right. Here's Jesus' response. This is the context of what we're going to hear. That that question is the context. Jesus says, Luke chapter 12, Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now, if you've been here, that's what we've been talking about. If you haven't, you can go back and catch up on it. But we've been talking about the fact that you aren't what you have. Your identity and your security is... None of that's secured by what you have. You aren't what you drive. You aren't what you wear. You aren't what you own. Your life is not the abundance of things that you possess. Now, that's what we've been talking about. Then Jesus says, here's what it says, the next verse. He told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So what Jesus said to them, here's the way they heard it. A rich man got richer. That's the way they would heard it. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So a guy who was already rich got richer. And he realized when the harvest came in, he had a rich person problem. Here's the next verse. Then he said, this is what I'll do. Oh, no, he said, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Oh, no, he thought. 
I've been blessed with so much, I don't even have any place to store this. I put everything I could in my closet, and then I got more boxes, and I packed it a little better, and then I packed my attic full, and I got that full, and I went from my attic after it was full, and I went down to the house that I'd built for my cars, and I moved my cars out of my house for the the cars, the garage, and I packed my garage full of stuff, and that still wasn't enough because I was still blessed with more, so I went and rented a self-storage place. Oh, no, what will I do? I've been blessed with too much stuff. He has a rich people problem. So this rich guy got richer, and he doesn't know what to do. Verse 18. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and then I will store my surplus grain. And there I will store my surplus grain. I know. I'll get a bigger house. I'll get a bigger master bedroom with a bigger master, uh, you know, Uh, bigger walk-in closet. I'll get a bigger attic. We'll get a house with a room that we can just store stuff in. I'll get another stealth storage unit. And I just want to say to you, from, from the viewpoint of this guy, what he says is exactly right. It makes perfect sense. If all that matters about what you have is what you can see, then taking everything that you get and storing it up for you, it makes perfect sense. If this world is all there is, then this guy makes the best financial decision. He just continues to store it up. He makes the right, complete choice. Then he says in verse 19, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. He's just saying, dude, I'm gold. I was rich, and I got richer, and now everything's set for me. I, I get this bigger thing bor- built, and I store it all up. I'm all set. Then it's just it's a smooth ride down the rest of my life. I'll just lean back. I'll eat, drink, and be merry, and I'll just ride out the rest of my life. It will be great. And again, I'll just say, If all there is in this life that affects what happens to you when it comes to your stuff is this life, his plan makes perfect sense. Verse 20. But God. What? But God. Now, wait a minute, Jesus. Why why are you bringing up God? We were talking about inheritance. It got getting me and my brother. He wouldn't divide it right. You started on this story, and we were going down that trail. Why would you have to bring God into the equation? Now, Of course, for all of us who are standing on the outside, who are Christ followers, we see God through this whole story because, of course, Jesus started with the ground produced, the ground produced a a rich harvest, an abundant harvest. Now, I just remind you what farmers know that maybe if you haven't grown anything for a while, you forget. That is that you can get the right seed and put the right fertilizer, prepare the soil exactly right. You can put it in the ground, and unless something happens under the soil that you can't make happen, unless you get the right amount of rain and sunshine at the right time and the right amount, if God doesn't do something in the ground, if the ground doesn't produce, you don't get a harvest. So out through this whole story, Jesus is making clear, God's in this. And you can see it from the outside, but this guy, all he sees is, I did everything. It was me. I put the stuff in the ground. I got an abundant harvest. All of this is happening. This guy says, my stuff? If it's just my stuff, then what does this have to do with God? Who provided the ground? Well, that'd be God. Who gave the rain and the sunshine? Well, yeah, that'd be God. And there's about to be something else that gets taken from him that he hadn't thought about, Jesus says. But God said to him, you fool. Now, this is important to you. You need to hear this. If you weren't listening, catch up real clear because I'm about to say to you something that you might have mistaken that people often say out of the Bible. Jesus doesn't call this guy a fool fool because he's rich. Because, of course, who made this guy rich? God. I mean, who gave this guy the ground? Who, Who made the ground? Who produced the abundant harvest? God. So this guy isn't called a fool by Jesus because he's rich because God made him rich. He's not... Called a fool because he got richer than he was. God, the one that made him. He wasn't called a fool for anything other than he looked at every financial decision from the viewpoint of this world only. And he didn't take into account there was something else going on. And when you make a decision based on this world only, when your financial decisions are based only on this world, God looks at you and says, you're a fool. But God said to him, You fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. You couldn't provide the sun. 
You couldn't provide the rain. You didn't provide the soil. And you don't get to provide, count on how many days you get to see the sun or rain or stand on the soil. But God said to the man, you fool, this very night, your life will be required from you. You looked at your money only through the lens of what would go in this world. You're a fool. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? The answer? Somebody else. You stored it all up for you. You didn't give it away. You, didn't, you only saw it as being for you since it came to you. It was for you. Now somebody else is going to get everything you had. Not because you had the joy of giving it away. They get it not because you gave it. They get it because you're dead. Somebody else gets it. But they do it because you're dead. And now Jesus is going to apply the story. Verse 21. This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not, read these last three words with me, rich toward God. But is not, one more time, rich toward God. Now for the people that are standing there listening to Jesus that day, I bet for the guy who asked this question about the inheritance, rich toward God's a whole new category. The truth is, rich toward God might be a whole new category for you. Now, your whole life, you just looked at the way you handle stuff. Is, that's just about me and stuff and how it goes on here. That didn't have anything. You never thought about being rich toward God. You viewed everything in this world based on this world. You never considered but God. And how things in this world and how... I mean, this guy had only viewed his wealth and his money through the lens of this world, but God. And when he missed the right perspective on that, when he didn't get the right perspective on his wealth in eternity, he suffered total loss. And what I mean by that is when he died, somebody else got everything he had stored up for himself. So he had total loss here. And when he got to eternity because he was not rich toward God, he had total loss there. Total loss on both sides. So Jesus says to rich people like you, you and me, hey, you have more than you need. You're rich. And you got it because God produced. The ground produced. God gave you the ability to produce. So don't forget the God part. I was involved, God is saying, through this whole thing. And remember, as you're rethinking your wealth as you're thinking about your wealth. Think about me. Think about how what you have, how it can be leveraged to help other people. Because the truth is, you are going to run out of time before you run out of money. And if you aren't rich toward God when you run out of time, you will suffer total loss. If you forget to view your wealth through the, the view of how it affects eternity. So then Jesus talks to them. I mean, the next part of this, you'll have to read on your own. We don't have the time to get into it. But the next few verses, he says to them, because of that, I say to you, don't worry about money. The guy who asked for inheritance, I say to you, don't worry about money. Don't, don't focus on that. Don't, you need to focus on being rich toward God. And then he comes back around and he applies it for them one more time. In verse 33, he says, so I say to you, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Now, I've heard people in, all through the years talk this away like it's not really for our generation. But you know what I think? I think our generation has a unique opportunity. It's called eBay. And what I mean by that is, think of the thousands of dollars that could be raised at our three campuses to help the poor. If we just go home, and you don't even... You don't even have to affect your debit card. You don't have to write a check. All you have to do is go to the boxes you have stored with stuff you don't use regularly or ever, stuff you forgot you had that was in an attic, that was in your garage, that was in your self-storage unit, put it on eBay, sell it, and use that money to help the poor. Think of the thousands of dollars that could be raised to help, like we talked about sponsoring a kid earlier in this service. Think of the kids in Haiti that could be sponsored. It would make a difference for them and all you'd have to do, it wouldn't even affect what you regularly have. You just, you just look at what you have. You sell your possessions that you have that you don't even use anymore. And you give it to the poor. And as you do that, 
you begin to view how you can leverage your stuff. It's just about getting your stuff, your money, your assets in circulation, leverage them for the benefit of other people. And Jesus says you lay up a foundation for yourself and the life is, is to come. You lay up treasure for yourself in heaven. God will reward you. Well, Ed, I just say to you, I don't know that it's all that good a thing. It seems sort of self-focused for us to think about, you know, giving stuff and that somehow we're going to get a reward for that. That doesn't even sound like the right way to give. Well, then don't think about that. Go ahead and sell your stuff and give it to the poor. And just don't think about what's going to happen in eternity. All I'm telling you is this is what Jesus said. God's going to handle the reward part anyway. So if that's too self-focused for you and that puts you on the wrong track, then don't think about that. But don't let that be an excuse for you not selling your stuff and giving to the poor because you don't want to focus on the reward. God's going to handle all of that anyway. I'm just telling you that's what Jesus said would happen. And here's how he said the rest of it. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide for yourselves, uh, provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fare, fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. And then he gets right to the heart of the issue. What he says next is the reason we talk about this. This is the reason that people in culture, a culture like ours, the richest the world has ever known, need to talk about how we handle stuff. Here's the heart of it. Don't miss it, he says. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You get what he's saying, right? That your heart can get so distracted. That God's, God's not standing back and going, hey, give me your stuff. God is not standing in heaven going, please give, please give, please. I can't help people if you don't give. God's not saying, hey, I need your stuff. God doesn't want something... God doesn't need your stuff to get done what he has in this world. God's just saying to you, I know how rich people can get distracted by stuff and how your stuff has a way of getting wrapped around your heart. And because I care so much about you, I want what really matters the most to me, which is your heart. And the way to get that is, what, is for you to give me what matters to you, your stuff. And as I get your stuff where your stuff is, your heart will be also. And when you begin to loosen your grip on your stuff, and I begin to get your stuff, I'll get your heart. And then your story will be not about all the people you fed, not about how you helped and all the stuff you gave away and the difference you made in so many children's lives. Your story not, will not be about that. Your story will be about how one day you began to loosen your grip on stuff, and it began to loosen its grip on you, and you suddenly realized that you had given your whole self finally to God, and your whole perspective on life had changed and you were different because as you gave your stuff away you began to actually give your stuff because where you send your treasure you send your heart and folks I know it's hard for you to see but where you and I live we have so much treasure and so much stuff that it wraps itself around our heart and you say to yourself that you've given God your heart but you don't give any stuff, and you lie to yourself, which is the worst place to lie. Because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So God says, well, you would hope he would say to people that he loves so very much. I, I love you so much, and I want to help you. I blessed you. I gave you talent. The ground provided. I allowed you to be a born American. I allowed you to live in this country where just by breathing the air here, you're blessed more than other people. I gave you the talent. I gave you the ability to work. I have blessed you, and I do not want my blessing to you become a curse. So, I don't want the extra to wrap its heart, itself around your heart. So, be rich in good deeds, willing to share in that way, in that way. You will lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. And I will truly have a part. I will have your heart. And as that added benefit, you and I will get to do some stuff and we'll change some stuff in this world. But the main thing is, you and I, you and your Father in heaven, will do it together. Now, with all that teaching of Jesus in mind, I want to take you back to the words of Paul that we were reading to conclude this. So, see all that stuff that I just told you that Jesus taught? That's what Paul knew that Timothy knew. So he could just say, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. 
That's what G- he, that was the teaching of Jesus. Now, with all that context in mind, I want you to hear this last statement of Paul to Timothy and what he says to tell rich people like us again. And I'll add the last phrase this time. Here's what he says, verse 19. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves. Now, we know that means that I have eternity in my mind. I see my stuff through the lens of eternity. And I don't store up stuff here because I'll run out of time before I run out of money. They will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that, here's the purpose for doing it, so that, here's why you're doing it, not just so people you can help people, not just so we do something, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Because Jesus and Paul knew what I know and what somewhere inside of you, you know. Our culture that is so rich is constantly every day calling you to take hold of a life that is not truly life. A life that tells you you are what you have or you're, you are what you don't. You're not that because you don't have this. And what we drive and what we wear and where we live and all those things define who we are. And that's not really life. And God loves you so much, he says, I want you to have the life that is truly life. So if you'll keep your eyes on eternity... And you will be rich in good deeds and willing to share. And you will leverage your stuff for the sake of other people. You will be rich and you'll be free. You'll be rich and free. Because you and I both, we've seen rich people who have so much and yet they're just they're driven to get something else, to find something else, to go somewhere else. And you've seen people that are so generous They have peace, and that's what God wants for us. That's what he wants us to have. God says, I love you. So tell the rich people to be rich, to be good at being rich, and here's how you should do it. Number one, you just start by admitting it. Hey, God has blessed me with more than I need. I'm rich. I admit that. Number two, because of that, I won't trust in my riches, but in him who richly provides Number three, I'll begin to figure out in my life how I can be a consistent giver, how I can really give, not just feel generous, but be generous. And I'll leverage what I have for the sake of others. And by doing that, I'll stand way back and I'll see everything through the lens of eternity. I'll see that there's a life beyond this life. With that, I'll take the extra I have and leverage it for others. And I'll take hold of life that is truly life. Now, can you and I talk through, just for a second, the connection card? Every week, your campus pastor at the first of the service talks to you about filling out a connection card and holding on to it so we can do these next steps because next steps are really important to us around here. See, if you're with us for the very first time, uh, we take next steps on these cards because we don't want to just come and hear something and take in learning. We want to actually do what God asks us to do. So we commit together. We'll, we'll decide to take a next step and we'll put it in an offering. We'll, we'll take those cards and we'll pray for each other about those things and generally begin to put in what God says to do. Now, if you're here for the first time, I get that it's uncomfortable for you. Maybe you're not even comfortable filling that out. and Maybe your next step is just to come back. We have a gift for you that we'd love to give you. It's a book out near the information center at your campus that we'd love to you pick up that explains the story of the Bible and how you fit into that and what God's trying to do. We think it would help your spiritual life. But you can take a next step too, and we hope you will. If, if you're a follower of Christ, I hope you will genuinely begin to interact with what we've talked about in this series. And I hope at least you'll begin to pray through this and how your view of stuff and your connection between your stuff and wealth. Maybe for you, the tangible next step is during this week of Thanksgiving that you're genuinely going to do that. You're going to be thankful. You're going to learn to be grateful. You're not going to feel guilty about what you have. You're going to be grateful, and you're going to count your blessings. And maybe even if you can't volunteer, you can just come and eat with people and be a part of the community in that thing. And you can look and see how truly blessed you are and get a focus on what God has done for you. Or maybe a next step for, for many of you would be I'm going to go home and I'm going to go through some of the stuff that I have that I clearly don't need anymore because I pack it away in boxes and I don't even remember what it is. And I'm going to sell that and I'm going to give the poor. A starting place for you to begin to give regularly is, is you, you know, $35 a month, as we talked about, would sponsor a child in Haiti. $35 a month is about a 
buck 25 a day. You won't even miss a buck 25 a day. It's like a Coke, and you don't even need to drink that every day. For $35 a month, which you will never miss, it will make such a huge difference in the life of a kid in Haiti. So when we're done, you could step out at every campus. We're going to have children that you could sponsor and make a difference in their life for $35 a month. And that dollar twenty-five a day would be a start toward you laying up a treasure in heaven. You can begin to regularly give. Whatever your next step is, if you mark it, you fold that card, you drop it in the offering. We really will pray for you about those things and anything that we need to connect, uh, contact you on, we'll contact you about. I, I want to end with this. You know, the vast majority of us, I don't want to argue with you about all of us, the vast majority of us are going to run out of time before we run out of money. That's just the truth. So, would you not turn out to be a fool? Would you use your time and your stuff, the extra that God's blessed you with by being in this culture, and leverage it for the sake of others so that you can take hold of the life that is truly life? Let's bow together and pray. Father in heaven, thank you for how richly you have blessed us. We have way more than we need. We're rich. Help us to trust in you and to figure out ways not to just feel compassion for people and want to be generous, but we'll genuinely begin to be givers, and we will blow people away with how generous we are because we're going to keep an eye on eternity. We're going to see how what we have, it impacts the next world. Help us not to forget that and lay hold of true life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.